the basic idea is that agents of the government, you, you have a right to remain free from prosecutions based on fabricated evidence or, or perjured evidence or uh, suppressed exculpatory evidence. And then in Devereaux v. Abbey, it was a companion case, Devereaux v. Perez, Perez was a cop, Devereaux v. Abbey, I think, was, or Perez, I think, was a detective, and Abbey was, you know, low, lower level cop, and then there were social workers involved. And what the, the Ninth Circuit said there, and this was in a concurring opinion in Devereaux v. Abbey, was that these same basic principles and rules apply with equal force to government social workers involved in child abuse investigations. So that's, that's where it starts. And then from there it's progressed through Kostanich all the way up to Hardwick. And the same concept now applies across the board. So if the foster parent is being attacked and accused in a court proceeding falsely, that right to remain free of prosecutions based on false information is intact for the foster uh, provider as well. Now there's got to be an underlying um, right that's impaired by the attack. So like for example, a foster care license, that's an underlying property interest. They can't lie to get it taken away from you. An established guardianship, that uh, gives rise to a whole bunch of quasi-parental rights that they can't attack and take away from you based on false evidence. So I think that answers the question. Um, yeah. Um, let's go to the Ninth Circuit and they send the case back here. I've been in Ninth Circuit twice in addition to sections. I get back here and I get farted out of here, mm -hmm. so to speak. I'm not kidding. I, and, you know, because I read your hard book one in 2013. Um, so I'm back here again. And do I have to keep rewriting it? I don't know. I would have to see the specific order. Yeah, I have it here. I won twice. On this. And I'm not. Maybe in a break we can take a, a look at it. But just just so that, yeah, just so that I, I understand that. I can't answer a specific question without seeing the briefing, the document, the order, whatever it is that yeah. you know is causing you the issue. Um, what I can tell everybody here. And don't be offended or anything by this. I'm not here to get new work or to get new cases or any of that. that that's not the reason I'm doing this stuff. And Del, Del knows this. That's why he set, sets these things up or helps set them up. Is I, I'm here because there's a serious problem in the way our system operates and nobody is really doing a lot to fight it out. You know, in, in California, there's only like 10 of us that even do this work or, or will touch this work. And that's one of the reasons that it's taken so long, you know, 20 years. You have to, lit people have to be out there litigating these cases, losing these cases, and getting them up in front of the Ninth Circuit to, to, to make that change that we all want. So the reason I'm doing these, these presentations, and I've done a bunch of them, is to try to encourage all of you, you know, attorneys that, that are interested or see the problem and want to try to do something to help, to change, to help people, to give you the tools or at least an introduction to the tools that we've used. Again, I'm not saying that I'm the be-all, end-all. I, I don't know it. I know what's worked for me. Other stuff may work for you and maybe I'm just your first point of departure for further research, further effort, to build on what's already been done. So the reason I'm doing this stuff is because I want you guys out there fighting it out. It's part of the whole pain compliance strategy. I can't bring enough pain alone to make anything change. <laughs> right? It's the whole death by a thousand cuts thing. If I had a thousand of you guys out there litigating, oh my God, you would see bam, bam, bam. It wouldn't be 20 years to change. This overnight. It's pain compliance. You've got to bring pain. And that's why we're doing this thing here is to bring in and form up an army of people out there capable, interested, and willing to make the commitment to bring that pain to the government. And that's, that's why I'm here. So I'm, I'm not here for cases. <laughs> On that, why don't we take a break? Um, so the Judicial Deception Act applies from like the... I'm, I'm, so, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Can you speak oh. up? Um, the judicial deception, that applies to like the entirety of the case, right? Like, yeah.
Yeah, and your statute of limitations, it's, that's a good question actually, because your statute of limitations, remember, it's going to be two years from the bad event, right? Well, if you have a case that's ongoing for, and this is not uncommon, at least in California, where you have a case that's ongoing for sometimes years, and there's these reports being filed and things happening, and uh, yeah, maybe the initial deception happened three, four years ago, but they're currently still lying or propagating or, or re, um, you know, cutting and pasting, republishing the same lie. That two-year statute runs from the last time they lied within the two-year period. So you could conceivably have a judicial deception claim that goes on indefinitely as long as they keep lying about you indefinitely, which, which they oftentimes do. So, so, you know, just because you didn't catch them on the first lie within your two-year statutory window doesn't mean that your judicial deception claim is dead if they kept on doing it, this continuing course of misconduct. On the seizure side of things, it's, it's different analysis. The moment of seizure is when the clock starts ticking. It's when you knew or should have known that your rights were violated and you should have known that when they took your kid without a warrant. That clock starts ticking the moment they take your kid and you've got two years. The child statute is 18, the day they turn 18 plus two years. On the seizure. Direct misrepresentations, again, this is from Kostanich, it's, uh, you know, probably obvious. Direct misrepresentation about what the doctor said, you know, that, that's, you know, prima facie judicial deception. Um, the court in Kostanich, they actually lay it out. The misrepresentations about interviewing the children's doctors were especially significant. So when the social worker says, oh, I interviewed the doctors and those medical professions told me X, Y, Z, if they didn't do it, they're dead. Okay, social workers like any other government agent are required to correct and any dishonesty. We talked about this, or I alluded to this a little bit earlier, is once they lie, they know they're lying, or once they omit, they know they're omitting, they have an affirmative obligation to go back and fix it, to correct it, to let the court know that there's a misstatement or you know, misimpression in the record. Social workers, like any other government agent, are required to correct any dishonesty in the evidence and only elicit the truth. Social worker cannot avoid this obligation by refusing to search for the truth or by remaining willfully ignorant of the facts. They need to investigate every lead and whatever they turn up, they gotta give it to the judge. That reporting duty is to the court, not to the parent. So when they don't report it to the court, it doesn't matter if the parent knew what matters is the social worker did not meet their obligation to act as the neutral eyes and ears of the court and tell the court everything. Okay, based on injuries to dependent children. This is a new section to the um, presentation I normally do. May, mostly I used to stay out of these cases just because they, they look to me more like personal injury cases and that's, that's really not you know, what we're doing. It's not what it's all about. Um, but I've been getting a lot of inquiries from kids who were in foster care and aged out or, you know, from their parents where they were in foster care, got injured, and even from the court. I've been appointed now on three cases to investigate and prosecute social workers where children were injured in foster care because of a social worker's lack of diligence. <coughs> in administering services or in um, visiting, doing home visits, or in assessing appropriateness of placements. And all of this actually under the federal statutory contract, bleh, under the federal statutory construct, they're required to do all these things under ASPA and CAPTA in order to get their funding. They have to go out and do home visits. They have to you know, inform foster parents, parents, the court about what's going on with the kid in the foster home. And what's happening is I'm finding that a lot of the social workers, the counties in California, the counties, and I presume here in Arizona, the state, put a lot of energy into getting kids into the system. And part of the reason for that, again, it's the federal funding scheme. The, the, the metrics that drives the funding from the federal government is determined by the number of kids in the system at any particular point in time. Well, we know that government has a natural tendency, all, all, just on its own, all levels of government, not, not just CPS, 
but government has a natural tendency to continue to grow. Bureaucracies grow, they keep expanding, they build new buildings, they hire new people. So they need growing budgets, right? The only way you get the growing budget in this arena, the Child Protective Services arena, is by bringing more and more kids into the system. And their budgets, the, the way that it's determined, again, at least in the California counties, is on last year's basis. Last year is always the basis for this year's funding. So if they have shrinkage in their child welfare population last year, they will get less funding this year because they had a shrinkage in their basis. So there, there's this sort of built-in motivation to at least maintain the same number of kids this year as we had last year. Because at least we're going to maintain level funding, but what we prefer to do is grow. That way we get more and more and more money. And we're talking billions of dollars here, billions of dollars. So that's always, it, it's sort of hard to develop that into your story, your vision of the case. You have to think about it and see how you're going to factor that in. Um, <clears throat> but we try to do that in every case. And the evidence is there to support it. I've got, and I've published it online, you can get the deposition of Michael Riley. He's a retired director of Orange County, California, Orange County Social Services, um, whatever they call themselves, HHSA. And we, we have a deposition that's four or five hours long where we go through every step in the funding, how much money is there, how they get it, you know, what the impact is with the shrinkage, all the stuff I'm telling you comes from the evidence. So it's, it's not stuff I'm just making up. You can get there and get it online. And if you can't find it, shoot me an email and I'll find it for you, if, if it's a factor in your case. But it, it's something, see, I always have this problem when I'm, when I'm putting together my story. I say, okay, this is a horrible thing that these social workers did, horrible. Why would they do that? These are good people doing God's work for all the right reasons. Why, why would they do this horrible thing? And although in a civil case, there is no element that requires us to prove a motive. That's, that's crimes. We're not doing crimes, we're doing civil. We don't have to prove a motive. All we have to prove is they did it. The problem I have is that to motivate a jury to give you big numbers on something, typically they're gonna have the same question. These are, these are good people doing God's work for all the right reasons. What's their motive for doing all this stuff you're accusing them of? If you can give them money, that's always a good motive. Greed is a great motive for any wrongdoing, especially when it's the government. So you have to figure out how you're gonna factor that theory or theme into your case, and it's gonna depend on the specific circumstances. It may not work in a warrantless seizure case, or it may, depending on what your facts are. Um, the reason that I, I've used it most effectively, or the place I've used it most effectively, is in relation to the ADA and voc rehab claims, because one of your elements there, and this is how you get the discovery, one of the elements that you have to prove to satisfy the claim is that there's a source of federal funding that the state or the county government was obtaining by offering these services, these public services like reunification services. There is federal funding for that under ASFA. So there it comes into play and you know the other side always objects so it's hard to get that discovery unless you can show direct relevance to your case. There it comes into play because it's an element of your case. So you get it, period. And what we did in that situation is we got the county person most knowledgeable Figure they're lying to us, they always do. And then we subpoenaed the state, California state, state CDSS person most knowledgeable to get the true story. And what they were giving to the county of Los Angeles in 2000, when that happened, 2011, was $907 million for that year, that fiscal year, to operate their Child Protective Services Agency. So we're talking big money. And if you can get those numbers, you know, you get in front of a jury and say, uh, with a witness, so you got $907 million, 2011, the year you were doing this thing here, to fund this big organization. And then we start talking about, you know, how we drive the funding for the whole organization, how we, you know, get shrinkage if we don't grab as many kids as we did last year, and you start thinking about a motive. That starts to sound pretty good. Uh, no, LA, what's LA, like 8 million? Yeah, yeah. Orange County in, uh, I think it was 2012, they had like 1.2 billion. So they were, they were pretty active still. They're not so active anymore. Their budgets dropped quite a bit. 
Um, Kern County, same thing. They're, they've cut it in half in uh, Kern County, California. They took the whole warrant thing really seriously. And uh, they, they just, they don't take kids. They, they went down from like 1,000 kids a month to 350, all the, it, it's sort of a bummer because the, the um, <laughs> well, no, I'm just talking for, about for the, for the juvenile dependency attorneys because, you know, they had a vibrant practice going on up there. And all of a sudden, they don't have work. So the court-appointed attorneys are getting laid off. The private counsel are having to find other work. So there's this big redistribution um, that went on that was pretty painful for the attorneys working in the system up there. Obviously, it's good for the families and the parents. But um, you know, I've rambled a little bit. The reason I bring it up is just because there are ramifications uh, real ramifications in other people's lives when we force this compliance on the government. There, there are other people that are affected, so I'm not sure I care, but it's just an interesting anecdote. I guess I do care. I mean, they're, they're good people. Well, you know, this is the thing is the defense attorneys aren't making a living off the backs of destroying people. They're in there fighting it out to try to get those kids back. You know? Well, that was my attitude. That's how I came to grips with it, too. I said, yeah, you know what? There's not enough work there. Come on down, man. Learn this thing. We'll do it. I'll help you out. <laughs> There's plenty of other work. Anyway, injuries to children in foster care. Special relationship is the, the most popular theory that we go under. And uh, I mentioned Tomas earlier, but for a different purpose. That, that was in relation to qualified immunity and how qualified immunity is obviated, or there is no um, immunity. I'm sorry, absolute immunity for their placement decisions. If there's any immunity at all, it's qualified immunity. That came from Tomas, 2010 case. What also came from Tomas is this cool thing. It says, a child in state care enjoys a special relationship with the state such that the 14th Amendment substantive due process clause protects a foster child's liberty interest in social worker supervision and protection from harm inflicted by a foster parent. What's important here Remember that distinction between substantive and procedural due process and the analytical framework that attaches to those, how it's different. We have to show deliberate indifference, reckless disregard when we're talking about substantive due process issues. So this is substantive. So we're gonna have to show reckless indifference uh, or deliberate indifference, reckless disregard. So anyway, the rule is once the state assumes wardship of a child, the state owes the child, as part of that person's protected liberty interest, reasonable safety and minimally adequate care. Now, I don't like the last part of that, minimally adequate care, so I never weave that into my depositions. When, I, when I'm going after a social worker on one of these claims, the part I get them to testify to is that, look, once you take a kid into custody, you owe that child, what is it, a duty to ensure their continued safety and security while they're in your care. They'll always say yes. Tomas is good because it gives us you know, an inch closer to what we really want, but what we really want is the affirmative obligation to ensure the continued safety and security of the child. The social workers, because they've been prepped for the depot, and their mantra is, we're here to protect the child, we're here to protect the child, everything's about the child, safety of the child. They'll, they'll get in there, they'll say that, say okay. Um, so that's what your primary directive is. Make sure I'm understanding you clearly that you're, once you take a child into custody, once you seize the child, you pick up an affirmative obligation, that is a duty, to ensure the continued safety and security of that child while the child's in county care. They will always say yes. So now you've got another really cool jury instruction that's evidence. There's nothing the judge can do to, to keep that out. There's nothing the judge can do to you know, modify your jury instruction. That is the testimony. They've been trained on that. That's the policy. That's the testimony. Okay, now let's look at what you did with this kid. We know that you had the duty. It's affirmative obligation. I like that phrase, affirmative obligation. It means you actually have to go out and do something. You have this affirmative obligation. Let's look at what you did. And then you get into the soup. State can also be held liable under the 14th Amendment's Due Process Clause for failing to protect an in individual from harm by third parties where the state action affirmatively, affirmatively places the plaintiff in a position of danger. That is where the state created 
where state action creates or exposes an individual to a danger which he or she would not have otherwise faced. This is a foster care case. It's Henry uh, V. Wilden. Uh, fairly new, 2012. I, I don't remember. It might have been uh, you guys that I, I told you about this case earlier, and it's one that you should go back and read because it relates to you know, foster care rights, rights of children in foster care. Um, and this is a state-created danger exception, because normally, remember, we talked about this earlier, the state doesn't have an affirmative duty to go out and save you, protect you, treat you any specific way. You can call them and they can blow you off. There, there's no duty on the part of social workers, cops, anybody else to save you or to protect you. Okay, but where the social worker in this context, where the social worker creates a danger that either the foster parent or the parent or the child would not have otherwise faced, that's an exception to the general rule of qualified immunity in a 1983 case for the violation. It's a very narrow exception, but it does exist. It's an exception that's recognized in the Ninth Circuit. The way, where we see this happening is in the foster care context have a foster provider, has kids, her own children, her own bio children, maybe an adoptive child also, in her home, has a pre-existing relationship with the county as a foster provider. County calls her up, says, hey, we've got these kids, uh, can you come foster them? She says, well, yeah, tell me a little bit about them. Oh, don't worry, they're great, great kids, wonderful, no behavioral issues, no nothing, you'll, you'll love them, they're great kids. So, okay, well, I'll come down and meet them go down, meet them in a controlled environment at the county facility for half an hour or so, talk to the social worker in charge a little bit. Oh, great kids, wonderful, no history. Well, where were they before? Oh, they were in a foster placement, but don't worry. Didn't have anything, no fault of theirs. It was an issue with the foster provider and we had to move them. So will you just take them? Oh yeah, okay, sure. Turns out that uh, the older kid is a sexual predator who's been removed from two uh, prior adoptive placements for his sexual misdeeds and misconduct. Also, he's, he has uh, violent outbursts, destructive tendencies, tears beds up, breaks doors, smears feces all over the walls, all kinds of things. It's all in the records. The agency knows all this. Don't disclose it to the foster mom. She takes this kid in and he rapes her kids. That's a state-created danger. All right, they, they lied to her. They didn't disclose to her all of the issues with this kid that they were asking her to accept into her home, into her family, and expose to her children. Didn't tell her anything about all the bad stuff. And then predictably, you know, something bad happened. State created danger. It's uh, probably going to be a, a pretty vibrant developing area of the law in the next five years or so. I think there's going to be a lot of activity there. Because like I was saying earlier, they're putting all this effort into getting more kids into the system. And now, at least in California, now that they're applying and adhering to warrant requirements, they have to work harder to get more kids. And what's happening, they don't have the resources to get more kids and watch the kids they have. So we're starting to see a lot of bad things happening, as rapes, uh, murders, beatings, all kinds of bad stuff <laughs> happening in foster care because the agencies don't have the resources to play both ends of the spectrum. And uh, so I think this is going to be a, de a developing area. There's going to be a lot going on there. The damages numbers are likely to be exceedingly high in these cases because we're talking about kids getting molested, kids getting raped, kids getting killed, kids not getting necessary medical care. You know, a diabetic kid going into diabetic shock because the social worker didn't even bother to tell the foster parent or give the foster parent the medical records or anything. I mean, there's just all kinds of, there's all kinds of, of areas where the agency is deficient in their treatment of the child once they have the child. So there's, there's going to be a big focus on this in the next five years or so, and um, it, it bears looking into. If you guys have cases or looking at things, consider you know, going ahead and taking a foster care case or a foster provider case where you have that kind of circumstance. I think those are going to be good cases, and they're important cases. Done any, any of this with the congregate care? I mean, most of the teens in Arizona who are taken into foster are not placed with foster families. They're put in some form of congregate care, and there are some pretty big issues. It'd be the same sort of thing. It's it's state it's state sanctioned out of home care, so it doesn't matter where you put them. You can put them in the Hampton Inn down the street. 
All right? But if they're in state custody, legal custody, the state has an obligation to make sure that they're getting minimally adequate care and that they're not in danger at the Hampton Inn. So you can, you, or put them at the Hyatt, put them at first class, man, I don't care where you put them. The state still has that obligation. So congregate care, group homes, foster, it doesn't matter. Yeah, there's, there's been, uh, it's actually interesting because in many of these areas we're talking about, there's, they're ripe for class uh, litigation. But what we've been seeing in our, in our research is that um, class litigation on inadequate care of foster kids is more likely to get certified than like warrantless seizure, judicial deception, things like that. Because it, it, somehow the, the courts, I don't really see the distinction analytically, but somehow I think the courts are just more motivated to address the problem on a class-wide basis where the kids themselves are the ones that are being mistreated by the government. So yeah, there's a lot of class litigation going on in the context of foster kid mistreatment by the state. And those, those classes are getting certified. Um, all right, the elements for the state created danger to determine whether an official affirmatively placed an individual in danger, we ask a few questions. Whether any affirmative actions of the official placed the individual in danger he would otherwise would not have faced. Whether the danger was known or obvious and whether the officer acted with deliberate indifference to that danger. So in the case that I was talking about with the known sexual perpetrator, all right, it's pretty obvious the kid that raped some kids in some other placements is likely to rape a kid in the next placement, right? I mean, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure that out. So it's a known obvious danger. And the suppression of the full information, the suppression of that information, the disclosure to the foster parent before she took that kid in was an affirmative action by the state. Right, so we meet those two elements. Whether the officer acted with deliberate indifference to the danger, remember we have a definition in an earlier slide about what deliberate indifference is. Essentially it means they just don't care. So where you have a kid that's a known rapist, you don't disclose, and the reason you don't disclose is because he's a tough placement, and this lady may not take him if you tell her, you're gonna meet the deliberate indifference standard. And it, I mean, it's, that's what it's looking like. We're not through the case yet, but what it's looking like is that this kid was a tough placement. They didn't know what to do with him. A group home wasn't even gonna work. And so they thought, you know what, let's just get him out there and hope for the best. And you know, the best was a bunch of kids got raped. Can a parent sue on that? If they um, the, parent of the, the parent of the raped kids can sue, and if, to the extent one of those kids maybe is a foster kid, then conceivably the parent could sue, I would have to look at the theory of liability because the parent isn't injured there. And in that instance, the constitutional right to continued safety and security inures to the benefit of the child. So that may be an instance where, you know, that equal corollary right concept doesn't apply, but I haven't researched that issue, so I, I don't know. You'd have to look at that. Um, to trigger the danger creation exception, the plaintiff must prove that the state affirmatively placed plaintiff in a position of danger or, this is interesting, or effectively prevented plaintiff from protecting himself or prevented access to outside sources of help. Um, and again, deliberate indifference. Now this second part, effectively presented, prevented the plaintiff from protecting himself, uh, same case. Mom calls social worker, says, hey, this kid just raped my youngest child. I'm gonna to go to the police and get this kid out of here. I, I just want him gone. Social worker says, don't do that. Do not call the police. If you call the police, we're gonna remove the, the sister too, who she wants to adopt. We're gonna remove everybody. We're gonna report you. There's gonna be a big investigation. Let us deal with it internally. So, and also challenge her license. Um, so mom is, oh well, gee, um, all right. And so she takes internal to her home protective measures to you know, isolate the kid, puts locks on the other kid's bedroom doors so that at night they can lock their doors, keep the perp out. Um, another month goes by, mom's calling the social worker, what's your progress, nobody's investigating, there's nobody out here, what's happening? Kid rapes the second child. Mom goes back again, says, hey, I'm done with this. I want him out of my home, I'm going to the police today. 
social worker and supervisor call back, start leaning on mom and talking about licensure, getting her kids removed just so the whole thing gets investigated. Maybe there's something else going on with her own kids, all this stuff. So again, so okay. Take some more measures, gets some other adult to stay in the home when she's not there, gets people to pick them up. She's doing all these things to try to protect her kids and still meet the directives she's being given by the government. Again, kid rapes another uh, child. At that point, she just had enough. Said, you know what, you guys can do whatever, and she called the social worker, and again, same threats. She says, you guys can do whatever you're gonna do. Take my license, uh, take the, his sister, do whatever you're gonna do, I don't care and she drove the kid to the police. He admitted to everything, and the police took him, and she, she begged the police, said, hey, look, this is what the social workers are doing and telling me. Please help me keep this kid out of my house and away from my kids. And the cops, you know, they were great. And, and a lot of times you see, you know, I badmouth cops all the time. I'm, I'm one of the worst. But a lot of times when you see them step up and intervene and take care of this type of problem, you gotta respect them. And the, the police here did exactly that. Said, don't worry, ma'am, we're, we're gonna take him and he's never going back to your home, whether he's in jail with us or with the county in juvie, wherever he is, he's not gonna be in your home. And that was that. Was that. So state created danger, effectively prevented the plaintiff from, from protecting himself or pre prevented access to outside sources of help. I think we meet both elements just based on the facts of the case, but. You know, that stuff is out there. If you see that come up, I think those are good cases. Um, to establish deliberate indifference, we already know, know this. It's a little bit hinky in the context of a state-created danger claim. There has to be an unusually serious risk of harm. Defendant's actual knowledge of, or at least willful blindness to, that elevated risk. And defendant's failure to take obvious steps to address that known serious risk. In other words, the plaintiff must show defendant knows something is gonna happen but ignores the risk and exposes someone to it. Uh, maybe a, these are not mutually exclusive theories of liability. Um, I think they're gonna be, they can even be concurrent theories, right? You can have a situation where a child's in state custody is entitled to continued state safety and security and then the state, say, puts a known child rapist in with that other foster child that's going to be both state-created danger and special relationship, right? You're going to have both theories there, and both are equally viable. You're not going to get double damages. You only get one damage for the same injury, but you have two different theories, and I think that you could get positive verdicts on both concurrently. Uh, municipal liability. For you guys in Arizona, it, it's not such a critical issue unless you're you know, going after the cops who were there to... <laughs> Then it's going to matter because you're always going to end up going after the state or the county, depending on who the law enforcement agency was that sent the officer out with, whether it's sheriffs or local police, whatever it is. Your uh, social service workers are all um, state employees. So you can sue them personally directly, you can't sue the state. That's a really loud minimum. So municipal liability. Monell will not apply. Where Monell may also come into play, besides with law enforcement, is where you have these private, a uh, good example is private medical facilities. And they're under contract with the state of Arizona, like PCH, for example, um, Phoenix Children's Hospital. It's my understanding that they're on information and belief. That, uh, <laughs> that they are under contract with the state of Arizona to provide forensic services in the context of child abuse investigations. And forensic means forensic interviews, forensic medical examinations, all sorts of stuff. Uh, but they're a private organization, they're not a government agency. So in that context, if you're going after them, you would go after the hospital itself under a Monell theory of liability. You go after the organization, you treat them as a municipality, and then the individu individual doctors that would have performed the examinations, vaccinations, etc., at the behest of the state in exchange for money in the contract, uh, those guys would go after individually. And that, that will be one context where here in Arizona you will have a Monell claim. And it's not just the private hospitals, there's service providers, people that provide, companies that provide monitoring services, visitation services, 
uh, mental health services. They're all private. They're all acting under contract with the government. We'll get into it a little bit later. There's specific tests you have to meet, but if you meet the test, they are a proper uh, 1983 defendant. And the advantage there is they're likely to be represented by private insurance counsel. Insurance company is paying an hourly rate to some defense attorney out there somewhere to throw up roadblocks and fight you off. The, there's a distinction between them and the state because the state guys, they're, they're getting paid their nine to five, whether they're winning, losing, whatever, they've got a steady job, very unmotivated. They're not gonna work as hard, number one, but there's not gonna be as much motivation on the part of the state to pay big dollars to settle the case. With the private actors where they have an insurance carrier that's overseeing everything and spending tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars in attorney's fees to defend against you, they've got a lot of motivation to try to put the case down. If they can't do it in their first um, 12B6 or demur, then there's a high probability that you're gonna be able to work a deal and maybe get a settlement there that you can then use to fund the greater battle, which is against the state itself. So that's a strategy that we deploy frequently is we'll, we'll bring in out in California, I'll bring in the hospital, okay? And you know maybe it's a small settlement because they were acting, I mean, the, the social worker told them to do these things and what are they supposed to do, right? Um, so they'll generally pony up some money and then we'll take that money, of course, with client consent and knowledge and we'll use that money to fund massive onslaught of deposition discovery experts, everything else against the government entity. So where we might have had a, a much more limited approach and attack on the government side of the case, if we can get funded by an earlier private settlement, the government's in trouble because now, now our war chest is full and we're gonna take it as far as that, that war chest will enable us to go. And um, it means you pull, pull out all the stops. You're gonna talk to everything that moves and, and really nail them down. So that's the advantage. But anyway, for Monell liability in the circumstances we've already described, a county or a municipal government or a uh, private actor that can establish is performing a government function is subject to liability under 42 U.S.C. section 1983 when its policies, customs, and or usages or practices are the moving force that is the cause of the uh, plaintiff's constitutional injury. So-called Monell claim includes only two elements, so it's pretty simple and direct. Fault, that is, that the municipality's custom, policy, or practice is the source of the constitutional violation, and two, the policy, practice, or procedure was the moving force that caused it. Okay, and uh, we got the case here, Monell, Chu versus Gates. You must prove the underlying violation as a necessary component of the claim. What that means is, you have a person, a cop or social worker or somebody, you have to prove that they did something to violate your client's rights. Once you prove that, that's a necessary element of your claim, then you have to prove that, that the municipality's failure to promulgate policies, training, um, um, discipline, you know, the failure in some way or an affirmative practice or custom or policy violated your rights or was the cause that had made the social worker go out and violate your rights. So those are the elements. Um, one thing that's interesting, and I don't know if we have a slide in here or not, but oftentimes you'll sue the line level worker who did the deed and then you'll sue the municipality or private en entity that's acting in a governmental capacity um, for the conduct of their doctor, nurse, whatever. And the, that individual will succeed in raising a qualified immunity claim. So they'll be out. They're out of the case. You know, if they have qualified immunity, they're done. It's an immunity, an immunity from suit. So they're, they're out. So what does that do to your Monell claim? If one of your elements that you have to prove is that uh, there was an underlying constitutional violation by this person who's qualifiedly immune, who's out of the case, what does that do to the Monell claim? It's really cool because it does absolutely nothing to the Monell claim. The entity is not entitled to any form of immunity. So if, if your evidence is that the individual who was out doing the bad deed 
violated your rights, whether they're immune from it or not, whether their conduct violated your right, your Monell claim still survives. And the question becomes, was the policy practice customer lack thereof the moving force causing the violation? All immunity? There's no immunity for anybody, Sean? For federal claims, uh -huh. federal claims under 1983, there is no absolute or qualified immunity for a municipal government, okay. period. So, the trade-off is there's no punitive damages, though. Well, yeah. Wow. But you know, you know, this is the deal on the punitive damages. If you did your job right, and you motivated the jury to do their job the way you think it should be done, punitive. When you get to a punitive damages phase, it's likely to be zero, because they will have already put as much money on the case as they think it's worth. So, you know, on the punitive issues, I know a lot of guys take a different approach, and I told you this before, I'm not the be-all, end-all. Um, I always go for the malice oppression fraud, mainly, mainly because it just helps your judicial deception case. If you prove up malice oppression fraud that would satisfy a punitive damages claim by clear and convincing evidence, you know, you're going to make it on judicial deception. And that's already the, if they believe your story, they're already thinking about huge numbers, you know, for compensatory damages. So, you know, punitive damages don't matter so much to me. In, in, uh, in Fogarty Hardwick versus County of Orange, we got punitive damages of like $3,000. And I talked to the jury about it afterwards. I said, well, what happened? They did all these horrible things. It was so bad, he gave her $4.9 million for it. I said, well, you know, we considered everything. And we felt that $4.9 million was enough to send the message we wanted to send. <laughs> so what do you do with that? I mean, you know, that's it. Right. I'm glad they did give punitive damages at least a little bit because the, one of the county's um, main arguments on appeal was that the compensatory verdict was a uh, secret punitive verdict, which is impermissible against the county. <laughs> so, you know, the obvious argument is, oh, no, 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 they gave punitives, look. They're minimal, but they did it. So they knew, they, they followed their instructions and it was all good. In uh, Duval, we, we did get the malice oppression fraud finding, unanimous verdict on mal malice oppression fraud. But when we got to punitive damages, the county again argued to the jury that we've received your message. In fact, this is what he said. We have received your message loud and clear. This will never happen again. <laughs> so zero, zero punitive damages. So on punies, I'm not sure what the value there really, at least in my experience is, I'm not sure there's really, you know, this tremendous value there. People know that the taxpayers ultimately are paying this bill. They recognize that. And there's always this tension in the jury room. You'll talk to your jurors and they'll tell you this. They know <laughs> that when the government's paying one of these judgments, their verdict, their judgment, ultimately they're the ones paying it. It's gonna come out of their property taxes, their sales taxes, their gas taxes, everything's gonna to have to go up because now we can't fix the roads because we have to pay out tens of millions of dollars in these, these cases. They know that, they're very savvy. People don't give them enough credit. So there's always this tension in the room about that. And that impacts their decision making on punitive damages too. And, it, and I would have to think it also impacts their decision making on the compensatory. They, everybody wants to compensate the plaintiff for the loss they've suffered in sufficient measure to satisfy their own conscience, right? So they're not going to go beyond that, especially where they're the ones paying the bill. So just, you know, you got to think about that kind of stuff.